I want you to go to the Gospel of John, chapter 4. We have been preaching a series of messages about meeting Jesus at the crossroads of life. I was reminded, and I thought about it a long time, that the paths I have walked have become the scrolls which tell my life. When I tell you stories about me, it's places I've been, things I've done, roads I've traveled. Not all roads are big and wide. If you didn't grow up a woodsman or a swamper like me, when you think of a path in, in, the, in the wilderness, you may think it's something very wide. It's not. The paths we would walk were normally 10 inches wide. You had to follow them. You had to be careful to notice where you were going. A lot of folks just meander aimlessly. And so Jesus meets us on places that are wise and roads that are foolish. Today I want us to take a journey. You ready? At the crossroads of a guilty past. Of a guilty past and a burned out heart. A guilty past and a burned out heart. Now what we're going to look at this morning, in all of the Bible, in all of the New Testament, this is the longest recorded conversation of the Lord Jesus Christ with a single person. It is the longest one in all of the Bible. And so we're going we're gonna to cruise through it, and I want us to see this marvelous encounter. Everything starts with context, all right? Now, what's been happening? John chapter 1. John the Baptist points out Jesus Christ in the crowd and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That is his public display that he is the Messiah. Now Jesus begins. We know he's baptized. He goes into the wilderness. Now he's performing miracles. We come to an amazing thing in John chapter 2. Listen to me well. You go to the end of John chapter 2. And they say that many believed on Jesus Christ because of his miracles. But Jesus did not commit himself to them. You had a believing people and an unbelieving Savior. They said, we believe you. And Jesus said, I'm sorry, I don't believe you. You see, you can agree with the facts about Jesus. All the facts. Man, do I believe Jesus could do miracles? You better believe it. Do I believe he's a, the God, the Son? Yes, do I believe he was born of a virgin? Yes. Do I believe he lived a sinless life? Yes. Do I believe he died on the cross? Yes. Do I believe he rose from the dead? Yes. And I'm still going to hell. That's hard to believe, ain't it? But it is packed. That's why the book of James says, you say you believe in one God? That's a fact. And you think you do well, but the demons believe that and tremble every day. You see, it's not agreeing with the facts. The facts are the facts. They don't change whether you agree with them or not. It's what you do. Then we find in chapter, chapter 3, a wonderful religious man comes to Jesus. And he starts giving Jesus praise. And Jesus looks at him and he says, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you'll never go to heaven. Jesus answered a question the guy never asked. He was lost. He didn't know how to find his path. And now we come to an absolute burned out life. Jesus comes 
And so watch what happens. Here's the context. You ready? Is chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John the Baptist, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples, Jesus left Judea and departed again to Galilee. Judea's in the south, Galilee's in the north, okay, of Israel. So Jesus is going back up north towards Capernaum. Verse 4, circle this. He says, but he needed to go through Samaria. Now, let's get something really good, okay? The word needed there means that Jesus Christ had a purpose for going through Samaria. Samaria was right in the middle, right in the middle between Judea and Galilee. So if you went with a straight line through Samaria, it took you three days to get to Galilee. The Jews would never go through Samaria. There was a racial hatred, religious hatred, many things. And so they would go around. It would take six days. But Jesus, now also, you with me on this? We're all products of how we were raised, all right? These apostles were not travelers of Samaria. Just as they would pray and then they, being with Jesus, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Obviously, we don't know how. Well, they come and they say, okay, Jesus said, follow me, and he will take you to places you would not normally go. Not to do sin, but to be, to do God's work. And so here they're coming to Samaria. Let's go on. Now look at the contact that's going to be made. But he needed to go. We're going to, we're going to, as this unfolds, we're going to see why. Now, so, he came to a city of Samaria, which was called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. This well has been reported to be 75 foot deep to 150 foot deep. It wasn't, it wasn't the well outside of the uh, Ponderosa on Bonanza. Okay? This was on an aquifer. This was on a, on a bed of water uh, river that would come down, and this town would come out and get their water from this well. And now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, he's been coming from Judea, it's been a long walk, fully God, fully man. He's tired. And he sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. That means it's about noon. The day is hot. Very, very hot. And a woman of Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So here's where we are. Something interesting is happening. Number one, Jesus stops. He sits. He's there first. Here comes a lady carrying an empty water pot. Very, very picturesque. And she's coming. She's coming at a time that doesn't make sense. The women would come early in the morning. And they would normally come in a group. There was safety. And they would get water. And then they would come again in the evening and draw water. It sure seems like this lady waited till everybody was gone. Nobody would be drawing water at that time of day. And lo and behold, Jesus asked her. It's, it's a shock. He looks at her and he says, give me some water to drink. And thus begins a remarkable conversation. 
between the Savior and this woman who's dying of thirst, a thirsty soul and a wrecked life. And so watch what happens. Let's go a little bit more. I'm going to try very hard not to go very deep in any of this because you can study here. I can preach a dozen sermons off of this. I could have preached already four sermons on this text. But there is a sweep of this story that I don't want lost in, in, in an abundance of technicality. Here's the Savior. Remember his purpose in Luke 19.10? He said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. If you're going to save someone, you've got to go find them. You've got to go find them. And Jesus needed to go to Samaria. If the Samaritans were going to get saved, that godly, paganistic, despised group of people, they were not going to come to Jerusalem. Jesus had to go to them. Amen? And I want you to know, that's the only way we get saved. Jesus seeks us. There's a, there's a big push in America, seeker-sensitive services. There's nothing true about that. The Bible is clear. No one seeks after God. None. Jesus seeks after us. Amen? If there's a yearning in your soul, anything about the Lord, it's the Holy Spirit drawing you to Jesus. So you be comforted in that. Watch what happens. Now the disciples are hunting down a McDonald's. Got it? Here we come. Then the, then the woman of Samaria said to him, Jesus just asked her, give me a drink. And the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew, verse 10 is a beautiful verse. He said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. I want you to understand, there's, there's four invisible walls. You see them, and they come into play, and they always come into play. One is racial prejudices. The Samaritans, they were a people. Israel used to be 12 tribes. Because of sin, they divided 10 to the north, Two to the south. The Assyrians came, conquered the ten, took, took the Jews, and brought them into captivity, a place that we now call Samaria. They intermarried with pagan Gentiles so that they created their own religion, their own language. They built a building they called their own temple. They didn't need to go to Jerusalem. They had their own Mount Gerasim instead of Mount Hebron. All the wonderful things. It was a counterfeit group. And there was animosity. You think there's some racial prejudices in America? I'm going to tell you a secret. You ready? Everybody's, every different, there's only one race. There's a human race. But there'll be some, they'll tell you, you know what, white people or prejudice against blacks. I found blacks can be just as prejudiced against whites. It's a human condition of the heart. Okay? The only people who are not prejudiced are Cajuns. <laughs> Why? Because we don't like anybody. It's just an honest dislike. The great thing about Christ in our lives, we overcome that. Amen? Guys, that's why the church, alive through Jesus Christ, not a counterfeit church, the real church, is the answer to all problems in a country. Because they will go where nobody else will. And they will go with the power of God. There was a gender battle here. A gender warfare. That's another wall that's out there. I mean, she was shocked. Three things just blew her away. First of all, a Jew 
is talking to a Samaritan. Weren't allowed to do that. Number two, a Jew is talking to a woman in public. They didn't do that. And number three, he's asking to use her water jug. You're not supposed to touch that. It was totally unheard of. I think that's why Jesus sent the apostles away. Why? Because I don't think they would have understood. They would have been too shocked out of their minds. Beloved, sometimes Jesus just moves us aside till he can grow us up to show us how to be. But they came and she says, who are you? And he says, ah, oh, if you knew. If you knew, you would ask. And she came. And she said to him in verse 11, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? A lot of people think that getting salvation is works. What do I have to work to get it done? No, my friend, it's grace. It's giving your life to Christ. It's learning to stop being religious and give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, all of this is weighing in. She doesn't really see where this is going yet. Jesus knows where it's going. And then he says, she says, Where then do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Father, father Jacob, Oh, that was a little dig. It was a little dig. Why? Because that would have, how do you call that? Triggered. It would have triggered a Jew. Jacob's not your, Jacob is ours. Ah, oh, Jesus doesn't pay any attention. He goes, he says, Jesus says to them, to her, whoever drinks of this water, will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never th thirst. But the water that I shall give him will come in him a fountain of water springing up into an everlasting life. There's some wells that we believe will give us satisfaction and quench a thirst in our lives. That, can, that is absolutely true before you become a Christian. And if a Christian gets out of the will of God, he'll find the same dying of thirst. One of them, one of them is, 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 what would you call, just wealth. Wealth and fame. Success and prosperity. Man, if I can find those, I'll be satisfied in my life. No, you won't. No, you won't. Why? Because the human condition, it's never enough. How about this one? Romance. Do you know, the more we become a lustful society, the less love is a commitment than an experience. It's romance. Well, we need to divorce because the romance is lost in our marriage. Well, losing the romance is sad, but you shouldn't have got married for that reason. Do you understand? Romance is no substitute for a love and a commitment. Because as you grow older together in the grace of God... Romance becomes very different. It really does. It is for the love and the bond between husband and wife is more than just physical sex. And it grows deeper and more beautiful as time goes on. Jesus was coming and he says, look, 
the water you're drawing out, it's never going to satisfy you. It's never going to satisfy you. But the water I'm offering will quench your soul, will give you peace and comfort and, and, and blessings. So what happens? What happens? They're just having this talk in the heat of the day. She never does get the water. Jesus was thirsty. You're going to see when she takes off, he's still thirsty. Ha! That cracked me up when I saw that. And so watch what happens. In verse 15, he just told her this everlasting life. And, she's, and the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Would you underline in your Bible the word here? I believe it's I believe it's of fantastic significance in this text. So easy to miss. She hates her life. I don't want to come here in the public where these people are, why? Because you're going to find she's a moral outcast. Even in Samaria, sin always costs. It leaves us wrecked and alone and broken. You ever, you ever saw a, a, a liquor commercial? Man, they're good. I mean... There is, there is a wisdom of satanic proportions with those guys. Man, they drinking. There's always a bunch of people around them. They're laughing. They're going. Years ago, there was one. These guys were fishing. They're out there fishing. They come around the campfire, and some girls come parachuting in with, with, with beer and they said, life doesn't get any better than this. You know, that's the truth. It only gets worse once you start drinking. It, it really does. It really does. What they'd never show you is that they brew that stuff in the tears of broken lives. I remember when this county was debating about going wet or dry. It was dry. It was the only beachfront property in the United States that was dry. And Little Midway was in tremendous opposition to liquor. And I got a visit from a preacher, from a county commissioner, and a businessman. They came in the early 90s to tell me I better stop. I told the pastor he was a disgrace. Because he was. I remember the county commissioner told me, it's none of your business. I said, ha oh, ha, pal, let me tell you. When that drunk man goes home and he beats up his wife, they call you. They called me. When they squander all the money and they can't pay for food in the house, they call you, they call me. When somebody's killed in a car wreck, they call you, they call me. You're on the blood money side. I just deal with the blood. I said, no, sir. It's a sin issue. And Jesus can put an end to that. Amen? That wasn't part of the sermon, but that was free. <laughs> because alcohol is king. It's bigger than Jesus in this country. People choose their churches over alcohol. Lord help us. This lady comes and Jesus knew all about her life. He was waiting. Because if you're going to meet the Samaritans, you've got to save a Samaritan. Amen? Who was first getting saved in your family to bring Christianity into your home? Starts with one. And by the grace of God, it starts to spread. Watch this, 
See, man, they're having this conversation. It's a surreal conversation. Jesus, God in the flesh, talking with this lady. Then watch what happens. Now there's a confrontation. I need to hustle, don't I? Look, look what happens. Let's start in verse 16. Then Jesus said to her, he's going to pivot. He's going to pivot. He's not going to talk about water again. Now he comes and he tells her. And he says, go call your husband and come here. Underline the word here. The very place she never wants to come to is the very place Jesus is going to meet her. Why? Because salvation never happens unless our sin is confronted and our shame is removed and Christ becomes our king. All right? And so watch what happens. He says to her, he says, go get your husband. Call him and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Oh. And Jesus said, you've well said. I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. Jesus knew her past sins, and he knew her present secret sin. And he loved her enough to come and offer her salvation. You know, people who have secret sin lives will always, very common, they will tell partial truth. Listen to me. See, he said, yep, you've told me the truth, but you only told me a truth enough to hide the real truth. I don't have a husband, that's true. But what you're hiding is, is that you're living in open sin. He came and he brought that out. Why did he do that? Was he being cruel? Well, if he would have been cruel, he would have said it in front of everybody. I love the fact that Jesus doesn't tell on my sins. Amen? There's one God and one mediator between Christ and man, the man Christ Jesus. Was he being just ugly to her? No. Listen to me. There is no salvation, none, until our sin is acknowledged and turned from. There has to be conviction. There has to be conviction. If we're going to have the possibility of cleansing and conversion, he looks at her and he says, he says, I know you hate being here. But I tell you, there's no place Jesus will save you but in your sin. You never get out of, you never get sinless and then get saved. You bring your life, your heart to Christ right there. Lord, here I am. Save me. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Guys, she had no place even in her society. Five X. Husbands. She was the Elizabeth Taylor of her day. I don't know what happened. But none of it was good. You think she got married? You know what? Yeah, I'm going to agree to marry him. Because I know this is going to turn out bad. No. It's horrible. Broken hearts, broken hearts, broken hearts, shattered dreams. Each time, it's harder to love just as innocently, just as deep, just as open. It becomes, sin begins to score our hearts. So by the time five marriages, how old is she? I don't know. She's not even married anymore. She's given up. She's given up. This lady was truly empty. She needed Jesus. Amen? Now, did you notice one thing? I'm just going to say this, and I'm going to move on. Did you notice something? It's just, it jumps out at you. All right? 
He says, verse 18, For you've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What jumps out at you? Jesus does not recognize living together as marriage. You're going to have people tell you, well, we live together, we live together, but we don't need to be married. We consider ourselves married. Jesus didn't consider her married. There's something big about that. It's so easy to miss that, isn't it? Say, hey, number six, you're with him. He ain't your husband. You're not married to him. Oh, beloved, let me tell you, there's a whole lot of arguments that disappear if you'll just get to the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. But look what happens. Let's go on. Now, I love this. Now, he's just said that about her life. Verse 19, and the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. The Jews say that it's in Jerusalem, the place where that one ought to worship. You know what she's doing here? She's saying, well, since we're talking about my adultery, where do you go to church? <laughs> it's crazy. It, it is, it is it is so slick. It is such a move. But Christ is not deterred. He's not trying to win an argument. He's trying to win her life. Amen? I don't want to fight with people. But I want them to know Christ. And Jesus comes. And, and, and he says to her, Woman, believe me. The hour is coming. When you will neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem, worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. That is true. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth, the gospel is for everybody. He says, the day is here. You don't have to travel anywhere. Because the worship, the true worship of God is in here. It's the heart. I'm fully committed. You know why you should come to church? Because you love Jesus. God has called us to gather together, to work together for his kingdom, to love together, to show brotherly kindness, to move, and to be a wonderful witness. We're not, we're not a salt dome of purity, rejecting any, any lost person that would come in the door. No, sir. We are born again sinners. Amen? By the grace of God or sinning less. And being used of God in this ridiculous world for His glory. I just, I just love this. Oh, by the way, I know, I know we're on the topic of my adultery, but let's, let, let's talk about where you go to church. Why? Because her heart was empty and all she had was religion that's outside of her. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 Christianity is an inside job. So let me just bring this together, and then we'll see what, what lesson we've learned from here. And the woman now says, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And right here is the first time Jesus so clearly declares that he's the Messiah. He does it to this lady. He said, he said to her, I who speak to you am he. He didn't tell that to the Pharisees. He didn't tell it to the scribes. He looks to her and he says, I'm that Messiah. I'm that Messiah. And then watch happens. 
the beautiful conversion that takes place. And at that point, his disciples show up and they marvel that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said anything. Well, why are you talking? And the woman left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, I wonder why she talked to the men. Maybe because she was shunned by the women? See, it goes with the life. She was most comfortable talking to men. It was part of her life. And so she goes and she talks to them. And watch what happens. She left her water pot. And she went and she said, come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out to the city and came to him. Now let's go down just a little bit more to verse 39. Let's see how this wraps up. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because the word of the woman who testified, he told me all things I ever did. And so when the Samaritans had come to him and urged him to stay with them, he stayed with them two days. And many believed, many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him. And we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Will you, will you just give me your attention for a moment? This is an amazing interaction between the Savior and a sinner. How he took a heart that was empty and changed it. While she spoke with the Lord, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. She went from referring to him as a Jew. Then she called him sir. Then she called him a prophet. Then she called him the Christ. Amen. Man, she has grown in that faith abundantly. They've come. There's a couple of things I want you to know right here. Verse 10, if you knew him. I'm going to ask Beck. Beck, you come on up. Because we're going to give this invitation in just a moment. I have tried not to. I pray that God has given this, this message. I preach it the best I am able. But that God has spoken. Because salvation is far more than emotion. Do you understand? It's far more than emotion. It is an encounter with God. Emotion can be involved, but it's far more than emotion. There's some things that are just flat out true. Number one, no one is too sinful to be saved. Amen? And no one is so good that they don't need to be saved. Number two, no one is so lost that they can't be found. Jesus finds them. Number three, no one can be saved without facing their sinful past. You got that? Everybody has a here that they're ashamed, they're stuck with, they don't want to be here, but your sin has locked you in. Unless you confront that, my friend, that's called repentance. There's no salvation. But there's also the good news that no one facing the past and turning to Christ is turned away. This precious lady came with the courage that only God can give. Well, Brother Dennis, when did she get saved? I think she got saved between verse 26 and 27 when she took on the pot and took off back to town. See, the pot 
the pot had a real purpose, but it was also a spiritual image right in front of you. She left her empty life. She didn't need that. Now she is filled, and she runs back home, and she goes and she begins to tell them. I wonder why they came. I think it was because they saw something different in her. Amen? Let me tell you, if you claim Jesus Christ as your Savior and your life is no different than it was, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust that for a skinny New York minute. That that's salvation. Jesus changes us. But then... Here's the great danger in this room right now. You ready? There's some. There's some. Today's the day you need to say, I, I hear Christ's call. I want that life. I want to be born again. We're going to get up. We're going to put feet to our faith. The Bible says that, that faith comes by hearing the word of God. We hear it, that's private. We confess Christ with our mouth, that's public. We're going to be saved. I invite you. In a moment, we're going to come. Just come on up. Brother Don's going to help me here. Brother Dave is going to help me here. But then there's something else. Please. Because this is killing churches. They're relying upon second-hand faith to get to heaven. It won't get you there. These men came and they said, you know what? What you said got us to come and listen. But we believe because of what we've heard him say. Jesus Christ, when, when, my, boys, when my boys were little, there was a time. And this happens in every Christian home, or most. All right? We love Jesus. Your children are going to love Jesus. I remember we, we would watch football games. And when he was little, he'd say, Dad, what team we want to win? We want the team in white or the team in red? I would say, we want the team in red to win. He said, yeah, we hate those other guys. <laughs> what was he doing? Man, he, he, was, he loved his dad, and, and buddy, he was going to love what his dad loved. But then there came a day, I can still remember it. We were sitting, and the game came on, and he said this, Dad, who you want to win? And I said, well, I'm pulling for this team. And he said, well, I think I'm going to go with the other guy. Suddenly, he was making his own call. Let me tell you, some of us have never made our own call of repentance and given our lives to Jesus Christ. We're trusting in something we did when we were seven years old. Can a seven-year-old get saved? Yes. But it gets real tough to separate what was all the love about. Is Jesus your Savior? Is Jesus your Savior? In a moment, we're going to stand. I'm going to invite you to come. I'm going to invite you to come. The lady at the well, the only one, Jesus knew she was showing up. Jesus knew you'd show up today. This message is for you and for me. Amen? Will you come? Turning loose and giving your life to Christ. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. Just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. And we're going to sing, I've decided to follow Jesus. You come forward, tell these men. all Say, Brother Dennis, what do I say if I go up there? It's this, all I know of me, I'm giving to all I know of Jesus. Amen.